Hi everybody, my name is Jason Bahamundi. I am one of the owners of Run Try Bike and welcome to, uh, I think this might be our seventh version of Fireside Chat episode, I should say. And today Hello. we're gonna to be talking to Dr. Joanne Bullard. Um, who will be joining us here in a second. We'll be talking about sports psychology. We've just been joined by Om Gandhi, who is the Run Try Bike social media manager and he will be our moderator today. And look at that, we all got on really easily. So we are ahead of the game. We're getting better at this, folks. Two weeks in a row. <laughs> Some uh, information for everybody before we get started. Um, we are in the process of taking our fireside chats and putting them up on our YouTube channel, as well as on our website. So um, if you're looking for past ones, you can go there. It's at Run Try Mag on YouTube and it is also um, runtrymag.com. They'll be up there on the video section here real soon. Um, we want to talk about sponsors, people who have helped us get to this point. Um, you'll see the wetsuit behind me. Blue 70 is a sponsor of ours, been with us from the beginning. Um, if you're looking for goggles or a thermal head uh, swim cap that you'll be racing potentially Indian Wells in December, maybe, um, RTB 15 will get you 15% off those products. And then two races that we're working with remote. One is uh, Boise Running's Idaho Running Day, which will be on September 17th from 5K to a marathon. It's Boston Qualifier as well. Um, so you can go to our events page and find their event there and register. And the other is the Monarch Triathlon, which is a unique point-to-point -point all women's race taking place in Kingman, uh, Arizona on October 22nd, 2022. And again, you can go to the events page on runtrymag.com to find the event. So without further ado, um, thank you, Dr. Joanne Bullard, for joining us today. Really excited to dive into the sports psychology part of this, the mental aspects of endurance sports, and no better person to talk to you than you. Thank you for joining us today. Sure. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Awesome. Can you give the audience a little bit of background on who you are, what you do, where you're located, how you help athletes, that type of stuff? Sure, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Joanne Ballard, and I am a doctor of sport and performance psychology. I'm based out of Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I have my own uh, sports psychology consulting business uh, known as Absolute Fitness. I am also a certified mental performance consultant through the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, as well as a certified strength and conditioning coach through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Awesome. So with all that in mind, folks, if you have a question for Joanne while we're going through the fireside chat, just click on the little question mark on the bottom right, and we'll make sure that we uh, get to it as we're going through. Um, and we have some questions for you out of the gate, Joanne. So um, as we're discussing in the green room, to me, the mental side of this sport is just as interesting as the physical side of the sport. And I used to train with a friend um, who has since passed, but we always used to say, you know, the toughest muscle to train is the one that lies six inches between your ears. And so question for you is how can a person begin to develop that mental ability to get through tough workouts or through a tough race? Are there any tips that they can start with if they're just getting started in these sports? That's a really good question. Um, so yeah, with mental skills training, um, they're really compatible with life skills. So our ability to cope, self-regulate and, self and be self-aware. So each of us has our own levels as to where we stand. Some athletes are very tuned in. They're very, very self-aware. They know what's going on and how to cope and regulate. Other athletes, it could be a brand new area they're trying to you know, uncover and learn more about. But regardless of your age, your experience level, what events you do, every athlete really needs to pay attention to their mental skills training. Um, if the mental side isn't strong, the physical side is actually hindered, right? Because we're actually kind of suffocating a little bit from its full potential. So when I work with clients, one of the first things I usually tell them is that, you know, every time we meet based off of, you know, whatever we're working on, whatever, you know, they've indicated, I start you out with an empty toolkit, right? There's nothing in there. But every time we meet and I teach you a new mental skill, whether that be imagery or diaphragmatic breathing or goal setting, whatever it might be, you know, I'm giving you another tool to put in there, whether it be like a hammer, a screwdriver, whatever, whatever. Some of them are going to click instantly. Others, you might try and be like, nope, no, thank you. Not for me today. But as you grow and progress, you never know when you're going to need that hammer. 
you know, like three years from now, you could go back and be like, I'm ready to connect with meditation, or I'm ready to connect with, you know, those deep breathing exercises. And it might just click for you at that point in time. Um, the biggest piece, though, is patience, and not judging yourself doing it, which not a lot of us have, but and not um, like the not, athletes, what is patience? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's easier to ask someone else for patience, but um, patience and not judging yourself through the process. Because some of us may be like, well, why, why can't I do this well? Or what do you mean I need to breathe? I'm always breathing, right? So it's important just to like, simmer down and take a step back and just look at yourself like non judgmentally, because it's all about self regulation. And if we can't get to the point of self regulation, then it's a big struggle. Yeah, and it, it sounds like people can get really frustrated with that because I think, you know, we're part of the media, right? We we produce content for folks to read, and um, depending on where you are on a particular day, you might see something that that creates this anxiety in you to go and do more or go faster or whatever it might be. So, are some people born with the ability naturally to self-regulate themselves, and are other and or do what, or does everybody have to learn how to do that? So that's, that's another good question. Um, life experiences definitely shape a person just from how they were brought up, what they were exposed to. And again, it's all transferable. So what they had to deal with in school, right? What they had to deal with in their personal life or with their family or with their profession and whenever they started their sport. So, you know, someone could have had a lot of experiences at a young age and they're able to adapt those coping mechanisms and they're, successful moving forward and you could flip the coin and someone could have those same experiences and not be very um, well at self-regulating. Personality does play a role in it too. Um, there's a lot of research on personality and say it really doesn't matter what personality you have, you can still develop a very strong mental skill set. So, um, it's really the person. It's really the person. But I've a, a big population I work with are youth athletes and high school athletes. And a lot of times, especially with like pre competition anxiety, um, I'll transfer it into the classroom. You know, how are you in school? Like, do you notice before a test you get anxious? Or even with a working professional, how are you when you're in meetings? Are you comfortable with, you know, giving a presentation or talking to your boss? Because a lot of times that anxiety could be very um, trait-based, where it's just part of who they are, right? It's not you, always situation-based. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You touched on something that you're dealing with high school kids. So yeah. I can only imagine everything that they're dealing with in the, in the environment, in the world today. Yeah. One of those being social media. And I was going to ask this question later, but you opened the door to it. So how is social media impacted the 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 kids that you're working with and then adults like myself right where you might join strava you might you have mm -hmm. a garment connect with friends and then obviously we're on instagram right now um and people are posting their best runs you very rarely see right the 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 broken down body that's like this was the worst day ever of running yeah. always the happy go lucky i, I ran 6.2 miles today in a 10k and i set a pr type right. of post so how has that impacted and how do you see um, from from the students and the high school students that you're working with to adults, you know, dealing with social media and the impact on their mental strength? Right. So social media can be great. Right. It absolutely can form, especially during the COVID times. Like it, a lot of um, organizations and companies really form strong communities and structures. So that was great motivation. But you can always go down that spiral where all of a sudden you're looking at a post and then you feel anxious or you have a lot of self-doubt or you're like, well, what am I doing? I'm not as good as so-and-so, but you don't even know who so-and-so is because they're <laughs> across the country, but you're like, they have blonde hair, I have blonde hair, they run, I run, right? And you start making these comparisons, which really, oh. what's that quote? The thief of joy, I think, right? Yeah, comparison, comparison is the joy. Yeah, so um, it can be beneficial in some ways, but especially, um, with populations like youth athletes, high school athletes, or even college athletes, body image can be a comparison thing. So, you know, 
stay to the wayside for that. And that even carries forward, you know, as we get into professionals too, comparing what other people look like, what they're wearing, what I'm wearing. Um, what's nice about some aspects of social media is that some of these handles now are just the real people, right? Still, we might only be seeing their good runs, but maybe they're sharing some inside stuff or there's some accounts, I forget which one it is, but she's very funny. And she just has like, all these funny runs and everything that goes wrong on her runs and it's you know comical because you're like i've been there i've done that um right. but you know you individually i think everyone has to decide for themselves if social media is a positive or a negative there's tricks you can do i mean i do this i have a time limit on my social media on my phone and then it just once my x amount of time is done it's shut down because i know during COVID, i was mindlessly wasting time you know on social media um but also when we think about the apps like strava like you were saying um our training peaks garment so on and so forth they can be excellent but then same thing they could go to the wayside and many times you know i guess i don't even know when all this started 10 years ago whenever or even before that you didn't have this and you just went <laughs> like you weren't hooked up to a watch all the time being like what's my heart rate what's this what's that so you were a little bit you know you wonder well how are they successful and what's going on with us now right like why are we so tuned into almost every single thing we're we're doing right with technology so it can be absolutely positive and it can also you know take us to the wayside so we have to be very self-aware yeah and I'll, I'll give you the negative side for me personally i don't wear a watch anymore because the Garmin was giving me all this HRV data and I was getting anxiety about it, right? Yeah. Like it tells you your stress score. And I was like, well, I didn't think I was stressed. I was just sitting <laughs> on um, So I, I stopped wearing my watch unless I was swimming, biking or running. So it's basically become a device for that. Yeah. And at one point I was, I used Whoop. But again, it was one of those things where it was like, you didn't sleep enough last night. And I'm like, I just woke up naturally. I don't use an alarm clock. Like, what do you mean? I didn't, like my body just woke up. And so it just created this anxiety in me as well. And I was like, just get rid of it. Like, I'm not doing anything using that data. And it just created this anxiety in me. So I just mm -hmm. got rid of it. Um, and, you know, it's been much better for me to not have to worry about that stuff. And um, it has helped. Because I remember when I first started, which, you know, was about 15 years ago in endurance sports, like Strava wasn't a thing. Training Peaks wasn't a thing. Yeah. I mean, none of this stuff actually existed and you literally just went out and ran. Um, yeah. And so I'm kind of going back to that concept as well. And it's made a difference for me anyway. You know, everybody's different. Um, but you did one thing, which is Training Peaks. Mm -hmm. And before I get into that, I do want to mention to folks, um, Joanne writes for us. And so you can visit our website at runtrimag.com along the top tab there's articles go to sports psychology a lot of her articles are in there she has written a couple about body image for female athletes for us as well she just touched on that topic so make sure you go there um, and get some of those articles for those of you who are just joining us my name is jason bahamundi i'm one of the owners of run tribe bike magazine we are talking to dr joanne ballard i pronounced it incorrectly or originally <laughs> And we're talking about sports psychology and the mental side of endurance sports. Joining us is Om Gandhi, who is Run Try Bike social media manager. If you have questions for Joanne, just click the little question mark on the bottom right there, type the question in, and we'll make sure it gets answered. So I want to go back to Training Peaks you mentioned. For those of you who don't use Training Peaks, it is a system and app that you can put your training plan in or your coach can put it in. And then when you execute, the workout, it does one of three things. It either says red because you didn't do it at all. It says yellow because you did it, but not the correct variation of it. Or it goes green, meaning you did the workout as planned. How does perfectionism come into play? If you're the kind of person who wants green all the time, how does that come into play? And how does training peaks, you know, how can you overcome that if that's a, a thing that you're like, I have to have all green all the time? <laughs> Right. Um, remembering that you're a human, right? That you're that you're a person, and even though you might have, um, and I love Training Peaks, and my coach is awesome, and she puts everything in there, and it makes me all happy seeing what's in there. But life happens; things come up. You might wake up one day, and it's just not a good day. Like you might not be feeling well, or if you have kids, or a dog, or something else is going on, and you know something skews you off. 
But um, yeah, the perfectionist side and those who are a little bit obsessive with, I'm going to complete, like some individuals might, that could be a goal for their week, that they're going to have like all green on their training peaks for that week, right? And that's, that's a fine goal. But, you know, how do you cope with if, if you have a yellow um, or if you were scheduled to do that long run, this happened to me this week. I was in for a Saturday, but I did it on a Sunday because of life and it wasn't going to happen on Saturday. So I have like a yellow and I think a random red on this, you know, so it's kind of, you have to look at it as two, like one way is who else is really seeing this, that it matters that much, that it's all green. The other thing is, is it still being done, right? Like if you're still doing the workout or you're, or you're adjusting the workout based on your body and how your body is feeling that day, or if you are very stressed or very anxious that day, maybe because that all goes into our heart rate and everything, right? Maybe you couldn't push as hard as you initially wanted and you're off a little bit, you know, with um, what, whatever measurement you were, um, you know, trying to hit or the distance or, or whatever it might be. Like, how can you cope with the yellow or the, or the red? So really that's, you know, that self-acceptance, but also being able to see the positives, right? Like being able to see that silver lining of whatever you're doing, you're better than, you know, last week or the, or the day before, because you've been able to, to, you know, be successful with whatever that workout was for that day. Yeah. One of the things that I do as a coach in our onboarding core with athletes is I have the Christmas tree concept, right? I want your training peaks to look like a Christmas tree. Cause that tells me that you're still living life. You're still going out and doing things. So you might miss a workout. You're listening to your body and you're getting the extra sleep that you need and the extra rest. And so Maybe it's red or maybe it's yellow, but I go through the Christmas tree concept with athletes I coach from the onboarding concept because the last thing I want to have is an athlete have their life controlled by the Training Peaks app, right? Mm -hmm. You might have to travel for work. You might have to, you know, life happens, as you said, right? You move to run from one day to the next. That's the thing that happens, and there's nothing like that. Yeah. Um, oh, Om, we have a question for the, from the audience. Uh, yeah, we have a question from a healthy vice. Um, he asked Joanne, what is your advice for somebody that is training for their A race and they're overly focused on a potential outcome that they begin to hate training? Ooh, okay. So they're having a little bit of a, um, an issue with sort of like falling back in love with training or finding their passion for training. That's what it seems like. Yeah. Does that sound like that. Okay. Yeah. So I think at that point in time, you know, step back, go back into thinking about what's your why, you know, what's your purpose? What was your reason for signing up for this race? What does this race mean for you as an athlete? What's the, like, what's the value behind it? Um, and also, is it for a specific goal? Like what, what's the goal? Is it to have fun? Is it that you're trying to qualify for something? Is it just to do something off your bucket list? Like what, whatever it might be. But many times when you lose that, passion or you lose that connection, your motivation declines. And you may even notice that you go through that sort of like, like we talk about like social loafers, right? People who are like, eh, ebbing and flowing. We could do that to ourselves. Like we can be our own worst enemies when we get to that point in time. So it's natural. You are not going to be on 120% all the time. You need to recharge. You need to rest. And even though it might be in that training peaks, you might just be like, this isn't my week this is my week this week. Like, let's just, I need more rest, more recovery. Let's start again. for a week or whatever it might be, or you just needed to go do something fun or take a trip or whatever, whatever. But um, that grace that you have mm -hmm. with yourself is very important. And that's something, again, you know, we laughed a couple of times about that perfectionist side of endurance athletes, but that's hard because we're like, it's 20 weeks out, it's 16 weeks out, it's 12 weeks out, like this run, if I miss this run, you know, and that's where you have to think about if I miss this run, is it really throwing me off the mark so very much that I'm not going to be able to complete that event? Or if I miss this run, is it going to actually be something that is better for me, right? Like something that's going to help me recharge, help me refocus and help me get connected. And other things like with motivation, switching up your environment sometimes is a huge piece. So I know like winter time when it's dark and a lot of people might be on the treadmill, if that's an option for them, go outside, you know, like go outside and get in the environment or get a friend involved or 
switch up your playlist or buy a new pair of shoes, do something to get yourself, you know, sort of reconnected. One of the things you talked about was your why. And um, the question I wrote down is how often should an athlete refer to their why? Is it something you look at on a yearly basis? Is it something you look at for each race? You know, because it could change. And again, I've been mm -hmm. doing this for years. So, you know, my why from when I started to today has most certainly changed. But how often should athletes be, you know, reflecting on their why? Again, is it yearly? Is it by race? Your why really is connected into your ability to goal set effectively. So however you structure your goal setting, um, it's very challenging to set out like, you know, we may say like, oh, I'm going to sign up for this race or this event. And it's, I don't know, six months out, nine months out, whatever it may be. But um, what you need to be thinking about reflectively is how does your why connect into that goal to complete that race? And then you work backwards. You know, you think about that's my long-term goal, but now I have to think about what are my short-term goals? And then within each short-term goals, you know, what are my, what are my action steps? So checking in on your why, I mean, that's something that I do almost weekly because that's an important piece of my motivation. Um, for some people, it could be every, every six months. For other people, it could be every month. So there's no perfect time to, or amount of time that you need to check in on your why, but it should be a very, very strong connection piece. And your why is something that you don't need to explain to anybody. Your why is just really personal and whatever keeps you connected to, to what you're doing. Very cool. I didn't even think about visiting it on a weekly basis, um, but it does make sense, right? Because every week something new might come up with outside factors. Yeah. And so you yourself back into a training mode training mindset racing mode um just real quick here folks thank you for joining us uh, my name is jason bahamundi i'm one of the owners of run try bike magazine um today we are visiting with dr joanne ballard um and we are talking about the mental strength side of endurance sport every tuesday we host fireside chats um starting at 8 8 p.m eastern time 5 p.m pacific and we'll be talking to athletes, race directors, sports psychologists, nutritionists, um, people who are in the endurance sports world, and, and just giving you some information to take back to your training and racing. Um, joining us as well as normal is Om Gandhi, who is our social media manager. If you have a question for Om or for Joanne, excuse me, just tap that little question mark on the bottom right hand side. If you want to ask Om a question, you can do it as well. Um, just hit that little question mark on the bottom right hand side, type it in, and we'll make sure we address it. Um, one of the things, Joanne, I always think about is athletes, we tend to always want to do more, right? Mm -hmm. So training plan says run for an hour. We're like, yeah, I could do an hour and 15. The training plan says ride for 50 miles. We're like, yeah, this route is 60. So, you know, why is it that, what is it that prompts athletes to want to do more than what, than staying within the training plan? What is it that we're desiring an outcome to be, I guess? I think, um, hmm. so very individualized, right? It's something that is not everybody. I mean, there's some people I'm thinking about myself and a couple other people I know that you may have to run for, you know, say, say 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And then you're like, well, that should be X amount of miles. And if it doesn't end on a perfect like 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or that top of the mile, then what am I doing? Right? Like, I don't <laughs> want to end on 0.17. So right. So some people, oh, that's oh. a big thing. And other people, they don't, they don't care about it. Like, it's just, it's, it is what it is. So first of all, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But as long as it's within reason. So if it's something where you're really like, sure, this is my training plan, but eh, like I want to go this much, then you really need to be evaluating like, what is it you're trying to accomplish? Why are you trying to step so far away with what's sort of been like prescribed for you in that training plan? And really just kind of, you know, as hard as it can be, like go with the flow, see what, see what occurred because Maybe you learned something really valuable in that training session when you didn't try to hit that like solid 0.5 or whatever it is, you know, like where you're able to really just reflect on 
okay, what did I learn for myself on this run? Or what was something I'm happy about or something that like, I usually wouldn't take time for. Something silly about me is I run a lot of time on the Ocean City Boardwalk and we've had throughout the winter and the spring, these baby fox. And that's my like motivating piece. They're all over the place. And I literally like, that's what I want to see. Like, so I'll run and that's one of my motivating factors to get up at like, you know, 5 a.m., get to the boardwalk when it's dark. And then I'm like, where are the fox? Like, where, where are they? Where are they today? And I take my picture. And that's something to me that it allows me to be a little silly and just enjoy it more than being like, oh, let's go. Like, you know, and, and get going. So you might have to do something to like spice it up for yourself in a, in a fun way. Well, here so in the desert, we run away from the coyotes and the snake. <laughs> <laughs> we don't look forward to running with them. <laughs> That's our point. Yeah, go there and, and avoid those animals at all costs. Um, actually, side note, we actually saw a gila monster on the trail a few days ago, which I just, whatever, whatever, he just didn't think gila monster. And then we saw this, it was a dragon and it was like a little chunky little dragon running across the trail. And I was like, what is that thing? Oh. <laughs> he found out it's called a gila monster side um <laughs> so one of the other things that i always think about and we talked about it a little bit is rest days and what is it about the athlete mindset that tells them that rest days are a bad thing as opposed to rest days are what's going to help you get stronger and faster and be better for you know your event um i think it's the bigger faster harder approach that we have in our society today right like rest is for the weary like if I wanna be strong, I need to push all the time. I need to be going 5,000 miles an hour. Um, rest, is, rest is really important. Like it's absolutely necessary. And it's not just important for your body, but what it does for your mind is so beneficial. Like it allows you to get deeper sleep. It allows you to be able to really shut down a little bit more where um, other times, you know, some people may say the more I rest, the more anxious I become because I think about what I should be doing or, you know, but then you think you have to reframe that and being like, why should you be doing that? Is it because you saw something on social media? Is it because um, you ran yesterday, but you, all of your friends are running today, right? <laughs> but you had to switch up for whatever reason. So, you know, what is that should and why is it so, why does it weigh so much on you? But rest and adaptation days are so, so, so important. Yeah, you know, one of the things that when we design training plans for our athletes, I always build Monday in as their rest and recovery day. Um, you know, I, if you want to do yoga, great. If you don't want to do yoga, you just want to sit on the couch, eat an ice cream, by all means do that too. Mm -hmm. um, typically, right, we, we, because we're not professional athletes and we don't have all of our um, cooking and whatever else being taken care of for us, we have to do it all on our own, that Saturdays and Sundays tend to become long training days. Mm -hmm. And so Monday becomes the day that, you know, I'm like day off, you know, sit on the couch, do nothing. Is it important, do you think, for athletes to kind of have a day set specifically so that mentally they know it's coming up? Mm -hmm. And or is it, you know, one of those things where it, it doesn't matter when it occurs as long as it occurs. I think it can be both. Um, if the athlete is following a structured program or working with a coach, then sure. I think adding in the rest days where it fits best for their schedule throughout the week is, is important. So if you, like Jason said, like we're not professional athletes, right? So we, we have work, we have other obligations. We have, you know, a life outside of our sport, even though we might not see that all the time. But if you have a day where you're like, I travel to and from work, I'm super busy with meetings, but then I have to like pile on a workout. Maybe it's not worth it. Like that could do more damage to yourself mentally and physically than just typing it in as a rest day for the people that like to see green on training peaks, that might be a perfect thing, right? Having it in on the schedule, like that's my rest day, right? And then you're like, it's a non-negotiable because it's right there and now it's green. Um, for other people who maybe aren't as structured with their workouts or aren't following like a certain plan with their workouts and they're just doing it for themselves, then, you know, listen in on your body. And that also, I'm guessing going backwards, that should also be for somebody following a plan too. Like if you're pushing or you feel sick or you're not getting good sleep, 
you got to listen to your body and allow that self care to come come about. But it's important. Yeah, and I think as a coach, right, communication is key, where if I'm talking to an athlete, whether it's on the phone or something like this via FaceTime, you can get a feel for when they're tired, even though they're trying to hit all those green boxes and training peaks. It's like, you know, let's take a day off. I could see it in your face. Like you're ready for, um, you know, nap time, basically kind of thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we don't talk about a lot, which I do think has an impact on the mental part of this, these sports is weather, right? We tend to check the weather app 10 days out. What's the temp going to be? Is it windy? Is it rainy? And we make all of these decisions in our mind, but that's not something we can control, right? The weather. So any tips for athletes who are going to have, who are racing this weekend coming up, right? In five days that have definitely been checking the weather app. Any tips for them and, and for those who will be racing somewhere down the line? Um, you can't stress over what you can't control. So um, that's hard to be like, okay, sure, thanks. But um, it's, really important <laughs> to keep, it's really important to keep that in check because if you are so worried about, now you should be knowledgeable. Like if, if it's gonna be super humid or something like, yes, make sure you're checking so that you dress appropriately, bring you know the right hydration you need, so on and so forth and come up with your, with your plan. But you really need to think about like, what in this situation can I control? And those are the elements you take, you take ownership for. So we don't know, and it can change in the blink of an eye, right? We could think it's going to be a beautiful day and then it's a downpour or whatever it may be, you know, based on where all of us live, weather is sporadic, but um, stepping back and recognizing, okay, so like, this is my game plan. This is how I'm going to handle race day. I'm going to make sure that I bring, you know, A, B, and C. This is how, how much, you know, if I'm doing a backpack or my fuel pack, like this is how much I'm bringing with me hydration wise or fuel wise, whatever it might, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, this is the extra gear I'm going to bring or leave in the car or, or have in my backpack or toss at the start line or check, you know, so you might still feel anxious about it because it's an unknown. It's an unknown. And whenever we experience any element of an unknown, that's when a lot of us go a little bit haywire because we actually have a lot more anxiety bottled up with something else and we allow another element like weather or time or officials if you play you know not an endurance sport but if you play right. a team sport right um we can invest it in there and be like oh because it rained or because it was humid or because um i got there late or because they start right and we can put blame somewhere else so we we offset a little bit so one of the, as you're answering that question i started thinking about some other things right so what is, you mentioned the word anxiety. So is it anxiety that causes us to do things we wouldn't normally do? For example, I show up to a race, I bring two pair of shoes for whatever reason, and sometime mid-race I decide, and this, I'm talking about trail running for those in the audience, I'm discussing trail running. Um, and so I, I get to the aid station, you know, start finish line aid station, and I see this other pair of shoes and I put them on for no reason. My feet don't hurt, I don't feel like I have blisters, what is it that causes that decision-making process to say, you should put on a different pair of shoes right now, even though nothing is really causing it? Is it anxiety? Are we worried about something? It could be. It could be. Or it's something connected into, you know, at what part in the run, or I'm sorry, what part in the, in your, in your race, do you feel that, you know, you, you, will you get the opportunity again to change your shoes? So we could be kind of like overcompensating for doing it early just in case we don't have the opportunity down the road. So that yep. could, that could definitely stir into it. Um, again, it connects into that. I mentioned it before, like that, um, trait anxiety. Some of us traditionally, like I always say to my students, trait means T right. Traditional state is situationally based S for anxiety. So if you're somebody who's naturally a little bit more anxious, you might be focused on, many of these elements, like hyper-focused, uh, much more than somebody who is not as traditionally or trait-based, like having high anxiety. Um, and they may, eh, I could change my shoes, or, oh, you know what, I'll just wait until the next aid station, I'll be fine and do it there too. And they could view it in a very different pattern, even though you're both in the same environment. 
Yeah, I, I would probably, I personally would fall into the latter. Eh, I'll get to it when I get to it. No worries. It'll happen. Um, so the uh, phrase mantra comes up often in these sports, right? Yeah. Where where you know, people should have a mantra and, and I have one for racing, which is all gas, no brakes, right? To me, if I'm pinning a bib on, I'm going to go all out and see what happens. You know, my training should support it and everything else. Um, how important are mantras to confidence, to self-talk during training and during racing? Mantras are great if you connect with them. So if there's something that work with you, like work, you connect with it, you, you find that you become more confident and powerful, then full steam ahead, go with it. Um, I've had so some, exper some experiences with clients and athletes I've worked with, um, and I work with a lot of team sport athletes too. So one example I'm thinking of is a baseball athlete that loved his mantra so much that he put it on underneath his brim of his hat on duct tape. So it was written right there, and all he had to do when he was in the outfield was just look up. Other people might like write Sharpie right on their arm, right with their mantra as they're, as they're going through their race. Really, you can, you can do whatever you want with it. If you find that those words are connected to you and are powerful for you, then, then use them. The, the, the basis behind a mantra is that it's a repetitive meditation, really. So if you are saying um, a few words, what was yours, Jason? All, all gas, no brakes, was that it? Correct. So if you're saying that over and over in your mind, sure, it's going to hype you up because that's a very powerful, like exciting mantra yeah. to have. Um, if you've watched Finding Nemo, right, just keep swimming, like that's a mantra. Nike, just do it, that's a mantra. It could be something as simple as breathe. It could be something as simple as like my race, my pace, right? But as you are saying it over and over, it's repetition. So you are occupying your mind, which could be actually very distracted because you could have a little bit of anxiety. You could have a little bit of nervousness or worry, um, especially for people who are starting out. Like if this is a first race, whether it be a 5K, a half, a full marathon, whatever it might be, you're naturally going to have some you know, extra nerves involved in there. So this repetition of words makes your mind busy. It makes your mind busy. So really the only thing you're focusing on is sort of like this spiral of like my race, my pace, my race, my pace, my race. My... And it actually helps to calm down your breathing. Um, and when you calm down your breathing, right, it helps to uh, control your heart rate, control your blood pressure, so on and so forth. Hey, folks, we're coming um, close to the end of our conversation with Joanne. We'll be joining some rapid fire stuff here in a moment. So if you have questions for her, please tap the little question mark on the bottom right. Um, type in your question and we'll get make sure that um, we answer it. The other thing is, um, if you missed the beginning of this conversation, it will be on our Instagram post uh, feed right after this. And then probably within the next five to 10 days, it'll be on our YouTube channel, as well as on our website as well. So um, it's been great information. And uh, can't say thank you enough to Joanne. So um, one of the things that we talked about when we were in the green room was this 20 day mental skills workbook that you're talking about. And I'd like you to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but one of the things that I remember hearing about, right, is that it takes 21 days to make a habit. So mm -hmm. is that the premise for the book and, talk, and for the workbook? And, and if so, how does that work into it? And what is the workbook and how can people get it? Sure. So I've been working on developing a 21 day mental skills workbook. And the premise of this workbook is, and as I was saying in the beginning of the conversation, if you were on earlier, is that there's no correct way to go about mental skills training. It's really all about self-awareness, self-regulation. You can be a newbie with it. You could be somebody who's used it before, whatever it might be, but all of us can benefit absolutely from you know, working on that mental side. So the focus for this workbook is that for the 21 days, I felt that that was something that, you know, like you said, 21 days to make a habit, but also something that's realistic, like, okay, 20, three weeks, I could do something for three weeks, right? Because um, once you hit like 30 days or a month, a lot of things can pop up and we get very sidetracked. So I thought 21 days might be a safe little sweet spot to hit. But um it's going to be three different weeks with different focuses, but they're all building on each other. So the first week is going to be really focused on identifying your why and goal setting. The second week is going to be getting into understanding self-regulation and self-awareness. And then the third week is going to be 
getting into um, mental skills, techniques, and helping you apply them along the way. So each day there will be a component where it'll be an educational piece, and then there'll be a component where it's um, like a guided reflective piece for you. I want it to be something that is, I shouldn't use the word easy, but something that is easy to, to, to use. I don't want it to be challenging or hard. I want it to be something that Again, whether you're experienced or just starting out that you're like, I can do this. Like this is something that, you know, for performance or just for your own well-being that you could you could connect with. So within I, I just posted on my page um, yesterday that it's coming soon. So it will be in an ebook version and um, it will be available probably within the month, but I'll definitely be sharing more information with that. Yeah, and let the audience know where people can connect with you, website, you know social media handles, all that good stuff. Yeah. So my, um, my Instagram is at absolute underscore fitness underscore performance. Uh, my Twitter is at unlocks unlock psych. And uh, my email is absolute fitness LLC at gmail.com. And folks, let me tell you, um, I really don't remember how we got connected, Joanne. I think it was probably through Maria, no limits. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> and the articles that she has written, you can find them on our site at runtrymag.com. Go to articles, a little menu will drop down, click on sports psychology. Um, Joanne's work is on there and it's fantastic. And Haley Fisher, who is another sports psychologist who contributes to um, our platform, th they will help you tremendously just from those articles. But then make sure you follow them because the advice and the information that they are producing for athletes is phenomenal, especially for beginners. Folks, I know um, when you get into this, you see people are already running 20 miles or Ohm just mentioned to us in the green room that he's gonna be doing um, a race in Peru. That's a stage race, 230K, Ohm, is that what you said? Yeah, correct. 30K race, right? So it's like, hey, you know, just start with a mile. Don't worry about 230K. And if you can do the math, that's, you know, a lot of mileage. Um, <laughs> so. Um, but just remember, you, you are in control of your own endeavors, and we all started somewhere, which is why we started this platform. Um, we all get to our finish line through our own journeys. So you know, let Joanne and Haley guide you through that stuff and help you with that and allow our content to facilitate your way down the road. Um, so with that being said, we get to do some fun stuff now. Um, not that this... Not that the sports psych stuff isn't fun, because I love it. I could talk about it all day. Um, but we have some rapid fire questions for Joanne. Um, and, and now that I remember that you're on the East Coast in Atlantic City, it might make a little bit more sense. So we'll start with um, when you're running, music, podcast, or nature? Uh, music, if I'm by myself, if I'm with my dog, no music. What kind of music then? Favorite type of music? I have a mix. Um, I like Eminem. I like DMX. I like fast music. There you go. Yeah. Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Don't get this wrong. One more time. I didn't hear you. Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? I'm not against it. It's just I don't I don't order it. But I we should. So I'll take it as a nay. I'll take it as a nay. <laughs> He's my only friend. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago style or New York style then? New York. Yeah, of course. Nobody wants to eat a strong <laughs> Nice. Is candy corn a real candy? Candy corn? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's the candle candy wax. The, the, the Halloween candy? Yeah, it's like it's candle wax. Candy. Oh. <laughs> what about peeps? Yeah, your nay on peeps. I like peeps. <laughs> well, at least you got the pineapple part correct. <laughs> mountain vacation or beach vacation i know you live in atlantic city but i'm beach yeah and what about uh an event what's your bucket list event what do you what do you want to do hmm um i want to go back and do disney again that's a, the, the the marathon or the half i would settle even for the half i would say i would say that one probably awesome Joanne, thank you so much for joining us. Mike Tucker, I see you put in there Chicago pizza rolls. We'll have to have a sit down conversation at some point. Um, but anyway, thank you, Joanne, for joining us. Really appreciate everything that you've done for our platform. 
in terms of writing articles and joining us on this fireside chat. It's been amazing. Um, for those of you who are here just joining us, sorry that we're at the end, but you can see this on our Instagram feed here in a moment, and then it'll be up on our YouTube channel where the other fireside chats will be within the next five to seven days, I'm guessing. And it'll, they'll also be on our website as well. Thank you everybody for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Um, next week, same time, um, right here on IG Live. It'll be May 31st. We'll be talking with Yvonne Spencer, who is the founder of Fast Chicks, which is a triathlon club that's national, has about a thousand members to it. Um, and um, looking forward to talk to Yvonne, who was also on the cover of one of our magazines last year about her group and everything that it goes into to making fast chicks work. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll chat soon. Thank you.